Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming this evening. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, we have over 300 people in attendance and the number continues to grow as uh, people continue to join. I'd like to introduce uh, at this time our presenter, Dr. Marty Greer. She is an awesome lady. She is a veterinarian who uh, is uh, got a lot of experience in um, reproduction and a veterinarian practice up in Wisconsin. And she's, a, would call her an underachiever, but uh, that's just not true. She's the, a great lady who's also an attorney who uh, uh, kind of specials in dog, specializes in dog law, but she's also a dog breeder. So uh, with that said, let me go ahead and turn it on over to Dr. Marty Greer. Thank you for joining us tonight, Marty. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate being able to be with this many people tonight. Um, I'm in Colorado right now, even though I live in Wisconsin and I, I'm out visiting my dad. And he's like, uh, wait a minute, I don't understand this webinar thing. So um, he's, you know, struggling a little bit to figure it all out in beautiful, sunny Colorado, where um, the day I'm supposed to fly back home, there are four feet of snow predicted and Colorado is used to eight inches in Denver. So it um, it's kind of kind of befuddling to everybody exactly what's going on. So thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'm excited to be here as part of this um, series of presentations that I have been invited to present by Purina. So we're going to start with the, I hope it's after dinner for some of you. Um, it's not for me, but hopefully it is for some of you. And hopefully it doesn't make you all too sleepy. Um, this is one of my Corgi puppies when uh, he was waiting for his next meal. He was going to be sure that he didn't miss the next time that food came into that dish. Uh, gotta love corgis, they're good little eaters. So I'm going to start you with a few challenges tonight and say to you, do you get your bitches pregnant every time you breed? Um, I actually have one client that we're working with that's a large scale breeder, she's a commercial breeder, and out of the last 48 breedings that we've done for her in the last two, two and a half years, We've gotten 47 out of 48 of her bitches pregnant. Um, before she started coming to us, she was struggling to get anyone pregnant, and now she is rolling with a very high percentage, a much higher percentage than most people um, of successful pregnancies. And then this picture shows a litter of Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, and yes, there really are 11 in this litter. So not only do we want to be successful getting our bitches pregnant, we want to be successful getting them pregnant with successful litters. We don't want litters of one and two when we can avoid it. So it's really important to me that we get a chance tonight to talk about the valuable brood bitch and how we can breed her for maximal fertility and maximal success. So we're going to go through some tips. And like I said, this is part of a series. So join us next time. And there are some that are already in the can. So if you want to go back and um, view some of the things that I'm going to refer back to, because clearly we don't need to cover everything again, uh, that material will be accessible to you as well. My next that's question very, for you, Mike. That's, go a very good, that's a very good point, Marty. And I just want to remind everybody, if you do have questions throughout the program, feel free, free to type that in into the chat box. And I will be able to kind of monitor those and ask them as we go along and we will also have a 15 minute question and answer series at the end and so we can uh, catch most of them at that point rather than continuing to interrupt dr greer and uh, again i want to thank uh, prina pro plan for bringing us this presentation tonight absolutely and i do tend to put a lot of really dense material into my presentation so if it's losing you someplace it's probably losing somebody else as well so um, let Stacy know that there's a question and we can go back and review that um, so that it's clear to everybody. Um, the questions that we want to do that we do want to try to focus on taking are the ones that are general questions about the material tonight. If you have specific needs, uh, difficulty with breeding programs, things like that. Uh, if your sentence starts with my dog or my kennel, um, we probably won't try to put that in the Q&A tonight, but we can address that if you choose to um, try to reach me directly. My next question to you, my next challenge to you is, do you understand progesterone timing? So there's a lot of material that we're gonna go through tonight. We're gonna to talk about the physical condition of our bitches, preventive care, loss of appetite, diet, supplements, probiotics, the vaginal microbiome, teaching, or time, sorry, timing the breeding and breeding options. 
Now the vaginal microbiome, we're gonna talk about vaginal and uterine microbiome. And if that's a term that's not familiar to you, I'll explain it here um, briefly and then we'll get into more detail in several places through the presentation because microbiome is really important. So the microbiome is the um, colony of bacteria that live in a particular part of a body. Whether it's your dog's body or your body, you are not um, bacteria free, your dog is not bacteria free, nor should we be. And we're finding out more and more about the biome, the microbiome um, than we knew before. And I'm gonna go into detail on that. So just so that you don't get kind of freaked out about, oh no, I don't know what that word is, um, we'll go back and cover that. So we'll talk about first for physical condition, body condition score, joints, hernias, mammary glands and mammary tumors, digital vaginal exam, meaning using your finger for a vaginal exam, and then uterine health, including cystic endometrial hyperplasia, anti-inflammatories, and the microbiome, the bacteria. So body condition score is really important. This is one of my own bitches. As she was going into labor, she was um, at the clinic with me because, of course, you know, I'm a veterinarian, and we get to work when clients need to come in. So she was um, in labor, in her whelping box, and we want them to be in good body condition. Last time I showed a picture of a dog that was in extreme body condition, you want to be able to feel gently feel the ribs, gently feel the backbone. You shouldn't have to press down to feel it. If you have to press down, that means she's too fat. Um, but during pregnancy, her body condition score needs to stay good. So we still shouldn't be able to see her ribs. We shouldn't be able to see her backbone. When we feel her ribs, it shouldn't be like feeling the knuckles on the back of your hand when you've made it into a fist. It should be that, that rib kind of feel that the very back of your hand has, not your knuckles. But it also shouldn't be that squishy part of the heel of your hand. We don't want them overweight. We don't want them underweight. And it's really important that we have them at the right body condition. If they're underweight, they're not going to have the nutritional needs met that it's going to require for them to carry a pregnancy and to be able to lactate and take care of those puppies. But if they're overweight, we tend to see a higher percentage of bitches that end up needing C-sections because their body condition is just not great. So we don't want our bitches out of shape. We don't want them out of condition. It's really important that you pay attention to this. And you can teach people that are feeding. Uh, if you're not the person that's doing the feeding, you can teach people how to manage that so that it's easier for them to, to know. Like I said, by just having them make a fist and feel it shouldn't be like their knuckles. It should be like the back of their hand and it shouldn't be like the squishy part in the palm of your hand. Health screening, of course, is really important. It's um, critical that we do this, and um, we are gonna be talking about um, what the American expects and wants from a new dog uh, in, their, in their life, and they do expect health screening. Clients and, and consumers are smarter than they've ever been before. They can Google this stuff. They expect that you're gonna be doing health screenings. They expect you'll be doing hips and elbows on a lot of different breeds, depending on the breed. Um, I usually go to the Chick website. When a client comes in and says, what do I need to do for my health screening? I go to the Chick website, which is part of the OFA website, and look up the breed. Many breeds are listed in there, certainly not every single breed, because not every single breed is there, but as many as possible. The parent clubs have then determined what they recommend that in your breed club, according to your breed, that you are testing for. So we'll talk about OFA hips. I'll show you some pictures. Um, the two things that we see go wrong with hips are going to be hip dysplasia, which is in general a disease of the large breed dog, and then leg calf persis disease, which is a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. That's a disease of small breed dogs. Both of them affect the hip. Um, in hip dysplasia, it tends to be both hips that are fairly equally affected in leg calf pers or a vascular necrosis. It tends to be one side, not both sides that are affected, but they're both genetic diseases that cause significant hip, hip problems. And so just because you have a small breed dog doesn't mean you shouldn't be paying attention to their hips. You do need to still do x-rays, uh, particularly if your breed club makes that recommendation. Elbows are really critical as well. I think Labradors, Corgis, Bernie's Mountain Dogs, Greater Swiss Mountain Dogs, a lot of breeds have a lot of elbow problems. And unless we're x-raying and keeping an eye on what's going on in those elbows, we aren't gonna be able to breed dogs that have good, healthy structure. And Americans expect their dogs to hold up long-term. They don't want to find out when their dog is four years old that they're crippled by some kind of orthopedic disease that you could have known about and could have avoided using that dog in a breeding program. Americans are getting smarter and smarter all the time, so you need to pay attention to that. Patellar luxation is a disorder where the kneecap or the patella in the back leg slips off the joint and tends to cause lameness. That is not a diagnosis made by x-ray. It's a diagnosis made by feeling that joint. 
And again, that's a problem primarily in small breed dogs, but we diagnosed one in a golden retriever not too long ago. We've seen it in other breeds as well. So it's not just a small breed um, situation. And again, that's a pretty easy test to run. There's no x-ray. A veterinarian can um, put their hands on the dog, manipulate their leg a little bit, and very quickly tell you if that dog has a patellar luxation. Um, shoulder OCD is another test that OFA can do. Shoulder OCD is osteochondritis dissecans. It's when the cartilage in the joint doesn't adhere to the underlying bone correctly and you end up with what's called a joint mouse or a loose piece of cartilage in the joint. If that happens to the dog, it tends to be large breed male dogs that are most commonly affected. If it happens, it's sort of like walking around with a rock in your shoe. It's really uncomfortable every time you take a step. It can be surgically corrected, but again, it's a just genetic disorder that we don't want to be breeding in our lines. So if your breed club says to x-ray shoulders, that's what you should do. And then vertebrae, there's a few breeds like the French Bulldog that uh, OFA does certify vertebrae on as well. Again, that's an x-ray. So the only thing on this list that's not an x-ray is patellar luxation. All the rest of these are x-rays. Orthopedic health is really important, not just for our dogs, for what they're passing down genetically, but also for their ability to mount, the males to mount and breed a bitch and the ability of the bitch to sustain the weight of a male dog when he's mounting her. So I've had dogs come into my office that we have to hold up on one back leg because they've torn a cruciate and they still wanna use that dog in a breeding program. And I'm like, you know, cruciate ruptures can be genetic. Are you sure this is the male dog you want to use to impregnate your female dog? I want you to really think that through. So um, if you have a 14 year old dog that's stiff, I'm good with breeding him, you know, go for it, put him on the right diet, get him on glucosamine, get him on a diet like the joint mobility diet that Purina makes and will get him in physical condition so he can do the breeding. But um, if you have dogs with orthopedic problems that are genetic, we should be eliminating those dogs from the gene pool. Hernias are another really important thing to look for prior to the time that we breed our bitches. Um, well, our males too, because again, hernias are inherited. Now, the male's not going to have a problem with the hernia as far as the breeding goes. It's not going to interfere with his ability to breed. But you do want to think about whether you want to use it in a breeding program because it's, it's genetic. There are three kinds of hernias. There's umbilical, there's inguinal, and there's diaphragmatic. Diaphragmatic is usually caused by trauma, although it can be a birth defect. Those are pretty rare, and those usually are not something that we can diagnose on physical exam. Those are dogs that come in with respiratory distress, and that's diagnosed with an x-ray. But umbilical and inguinal hernias can be determined shortly after birth when puppies are very young. Um, at the time that they're into their six, seven, or eight week checkup with the veterinarian, they should be assessing dogs um, for this, along with a lot of other things. At that eight week check, we check for patellar luxation, we check for umbilical and inguinal hernias, we check for heart murmurs, we check for bad bites, um, we check for patellar luxation. Those are all things that should be checked at that visit, and you need to work with a veterinarian that's really good at that kind of hands on physical exam. But anyway, umbilical hernias and inguinal hernias are not the same thing. They're two different things. And if you have a bitch with them, number one, you should think really hard about whether she should be in a breeding program because yes, it's genetic and yes, you're going to produce some of those. And number two, if you are going to breed her, you definitely want to have it corrected before she's bred. Now, the other hernia that's not listed on here is either traumatic or surgical where at a surgical um, procedure like a C-section, if the abdominal wall didn't heal well, you can end up with a hernia along the former incision site. And again, that needs to be corrected before the breeding takes place. Now, an umbilical hernia happens at the belly button. It's going to be here where this dotted line circle is. So it's going to be up there. Some of them are reducible, meaning that you can push the contents back into the abdomen. Some are not reducible. But nevertheless, they're all genetic. It doesn't matter what you think. It's not that the bitch pulled too hard on the cord. It's not that my staff at a C-section pull too hard on the cord. This is genetic. So don't kid yourself. You're going to breed dogs that have these hernias if you're using dogs with this in their breeding program. Inguinal hernias can happen on the right or the left or both sides. And that's going to be down in the groin where there's a bulge. And this is a diagram that I found online that demonstrates the, the picture A shows the lump or the hernia. And then pictures B, C, D, um, show what the contents of the hernia are, which can be intestines or it can be a bladder, it can be part of the abdominal fat, and then E, F, and G are the surgical correction for that. Now, this video is surgical, so if, if surgery bothers you, look away for a few seconds. Um, and this is a male dog, so obviously this is a male, not a female. That is his 
scrotum that you're looking at at the bottom and where my fingers are through that incision, this is actually a case that we saw at our practice, where my fingers are through that incision, we are going to um, remove the intestines that have slipped from his abdominal cavity down into his uh, scrotum. So this puppy came in um, with a, an acutely enlarged scrotum. So for his age and his size, his scrotum was much too big. So you can see that all this intestine, can you see that hernia is now disappearing? Isn't that cool? I mean, maybe it's not cool to you because maybe you don't like surgery. Um, but that is the amount of intestine that slid through the inguinal ring down in the hernia and into his scrotum. So this dog is being corrected because he's a hunting dog, not because he's a breeding dog. So it's really important that you pay attention um, to these hernias before you do the breeding. I have had two bitches in my career that have had a uterus, a pregnant uterus during the pregnancy slide down into the inguinal hernia and the puppies were developing instead of in the abdominal cavity under the skin in that hernia. So really pay attention to these. If, you, if your veterinarian says that the dog has an inguinal hernia, or an umbilical hernia, fix it before she's bred, or don't breed her, because that's gonna, the weight of the pregnancy is gonna stretch the hernia out and potentially make more of the abdominal contents go into there. And if um, the uterus slides down in there or the intestines slide into there and they lose their blood supply, you're gonna end up with a super, super sick dog and a real mess on your hands, so be careful with that. And then we have mammary tumors, which are most common in the middle-aged and older bitches that we're using for breeding. Um, they can be uh, buried in appearance. They can be um, usually hard nodular uh, tissue that's going to be along the nipples or along the mammary gland. It can be in one gland. It can be in multiple glands. When our bitches come in for their pre-breeding exams, one of the things that we do in our practice is check the bitch for mammary tumors. And if she has one, you should really not breed her on that heat cycle because the effect of hormones during the pregnancy are going to make that tumor grow considerably, and that is not a good time to go to surgery. So you should not breed her on that heat cycle. You should manage it by taking her to surgery. You should get biopsies done, histology done on that to determine what kind of tumor it is. And if it's benign, go ahead and breed her on the next heat cycle. If it's malignant, you may have just saved yourself the loss of a litter because if she develops severe cancer during her pregnancy, that's gonna turn out to be a really unfortunate and very unhappy situation and I've seen that happen. So as soon as you find any lumps or nodules along the mammary gland, take her to the vet, get that tumor removed. And then if she's in good health, based on the histology, go ahead and breed her on the next teeth. Then our vet, the rest of our veterinary assessment is gonna be, like I said, bite, hernias, heart murmurs, patellas, but we also wanna check during the heat cycle it, with a glove on our finger, a vaginal exam. A digital vaginal exam means digit, meaning your finger goes in, and it should be done by a veterinarian that's experienced in doing this. It's not a do-it-your-home-yourself uh, kit, but with lubrication on a gloved finger during a heat cycle, because if you do this when she's not in heat, A, she's not going to like it, and B, you're really not going to get a fair assessment of what her vagina is like. We can feel for strictures or bands of tissue and other things that are going to, number one, interfere with the ability of a natural mating. Um, now, you can still do a TCI, you can still do a surgical with those strictures or bands in there um, because they're not going to be in the way when you're doing the, that approach, but a male dog is not going to be successfully able to get a tie if she has a stricture, which is a tightening all the way around, or a band of tissue, which is like a column of tissue that goes from the top to the bottom um, in there. Now, sometimes they're really tiny little bands, and we can break those with our finger, but I've had uh, dogs come in where that band of tissue is two or three inches wide, and it's not something that you can just reach in and snap with your finger. This is something a veterinarian should assess, and you should be aware that if she has these strictures or bands, you're likely to end up needing a C-section, so the time to determine that it's there is not when she's in labor and there's a puppy stuck on the back side of that because she can't push that puppy out. The time to fix it or to find out about it is before she's bred and then that gives you time to determine if it's something that can be repaired or prepare yourself for a c-section so don't overlook this a really important step yeah the dogs aren't real crazy about it but they're sure better about it during a heat cycle and then uterine health we've talked a little bit about cystic endometrial hyperplasia we'll talk about anti-inflammatories the microbiome antibiotics and probiotics so in general, up to 25 to 35% of all the embryos that start to develop in a bitch fail to go to term. One of the reasons is cystic endometrial hyperplasia. There's, of course, a multitude of other ones. But because of the effect of progesterone, this is the lining of a uterus. It should be smooth and shiny and pink. And I'm sorry if people don't like icky 
see pictures because that's kind of what I look at all the time. I feel really bad for the people that sit next to me on an airplane when I'm writing a PowerPoint because it can be a little scary to look over at my computer and go, ooh, ooh, yeah, look away. Um, so this should be a shiny pink, smooth surface on the lining of the uterus. This is a dog that when you hear a veterinarian talk about cysts in the uterus, yes, these are cysts, it's cystic endometrial hyperplasia or CEH for short. There is no possible way you are gonna rupture enough of these cysts or pop them with your fingers and not, not create such severe inflammation in the uterus that this bitch is ever gonna get pregnant. So this is a bitch that came in going to surgery for a surgical AI. We got into surgery and I called the owner and I said, there's no possible way this bitch is gonna conceive. Let's just spay her now before she ends up with the pyometra because that's where this goes. And today I've talked to two clients with pyometras. So this is really common. This is an underlying cause of infertility and an underlying cause of pyometra. So. Um, bitches over the age of six will have an increase in cystic endometrial hyperplasia because of the effect of that ongoing damage to the uterus because of heat cycles and progesterone being produced. So this is the effect of it in its most extreme form. But this is why bitches over the age of six have a 33% reduced fertility, either a 33% less chance of getting pregnant or if they do get pregnant, smaller litter. So don't beat yourself up if you have an eight-year-old dog that only had one or two puppies. It's likely she had some kind of underlying problem that interfered with fertility. Um, this is another uterus. This is at a C-section and you can see the same kind of cyst, those little clear bubbles, but those bigger gray, green, yellow plaques are resorption sites. So this is what a resorption looks like. This is not what a pyometra looks like. And we found this at C-section. So if you're a veterinarian, if you're standing there waiting for them to come out with puppies and your veterinarian says she's got this yellow kind of gooey stuff coming out of her uterus, I think it's a pyometra, let's spay her. The answer is no, 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 no. This is not a pyometra, do not spay her, it's okay. I had one vet student with us that was watching me do a C-section. And I said, now these are plaques in the uterus from resorption sites. This is not a pyo, and she put her hand over her mouth, gasped, and took a step back, and I said, uh-oh, what's the deal? And she said, my vet told me that that was a pyometra, and I had to spare on the surgery table at the C-section. And this is not a C-section lecture, but do not let your veterinarian spay at the C-section. So if you have a bitch that has cystic endometrial hyperplasia or has a fertility issue and you suspect inflammation in the uterus, using anti-inflammatories from days two, three, and four, and days 15, 16, and 17 after she ovulates will improve her fertility by about 50%. Um, and that was a study, there were two studies done that showed that. So the two anti-inflammatories I use are either Medicam or Rimadil, they're both prescription items. Days two, three, and four represents when fertilization takes place and that has to take place in the oviducts. So the theory is that the eggs and the sperm can get together in the oviducts because you've reduced the inflammation in the oviducts, letting the sperm get up there where it may have been blocked before and fertilization can take place. And then days 15, 16, and 17 are when implantation of the placenta occurs. So if the uterus is happy and hospitable and says, come on in, let's make a placenta, let's have a baby, um, then you're gonna have a better chance of fertility with using these anti-inflammatories at days two, three, and four, and 15, 16, and 17. They will not cause birth defects or other problems at that time of the heat cycle. So be aware that this is a, an approved uh, treatment. Now the vaginal microbiome, like I said, the, there's a vaginal microbiome and there's a uterine microbiome. And we used to think that the uterus was a sterile place, but now we know it's not. Now we've never thought the vagina was sterile. It's normal on a vaginal cytology to see bacteria. So don't let your veterinarian say that just because they see bacteria, they wanna put your bitch on an antibiotic during her heat cycle. That's normal, that's supposed to be there. That's what keeps the bad bugs out or the good bugs. So you shouldn't do that. But if they see white blood cells, which are represented in this picture where it says neutrophils, neutrophils are the same thing as white blood cells. If they're seeing neutrophils during proestrus or during the early part of her heat cycle, then an antibiotic is appropriate. When should you use an antibiotic during breeding? The answer is not routinely. Not routinely, don't do it every time or you're gonna end up with bacteria in this bitch or your entire kennel that you'll never be able to kill with the antibiotic because you're gonna create superbugs. But if you see white blood cells during the early heat cycle, if they do a culture and they only grow one kind of bacteria or if the bitch has a fertility issue, then an antibiotic would be appropriate. And this is something that you need to talk your veterinarian about and not just go reaching for something on the shelf because not all antibiotics are safe. Probiotics should be used anytime an antibiotic is used to make sure that we don't upset the GI tract 
and other parts of the body. So make sure if you're putting her on an antibiotic that you do a probiotic along with it. Now we're going to talk about preventive care. Aren't these the, the cutest little dogs? They're Finnish Lapins. Um, vaccines, of course, you want to keep your bitches up to date and you should not vaccinate during your heat cycle or during pregnancy. So if you're planning on breeding her and she's coming up due for a rabies vaccination or a Lyme vaccination or some of those other really important ones, go ahead and get her vaccinated before she comes into heat. Jean Dodds is a huge proponent of saying do not vaccinate even during the heat cycle because if you set up inflammation, you can interfere with fertility and you can make her sick. Now, a nomogram is a really cool test. A nomogram is basically a titer that's done during pregnancy to assess what kind of antibodies the bitch is going to pass to her puppies. So it's a test that assesses her antibody level for parvo and for distemper. Those are the only two things we can assess. Um, when I do mine, I do those only at the University of Wisconsin, which I'm going to show you some slides here in a couple of minutes that if you have a cell phone, you might want to grab and take some pictures of the slides so you get the information. And if you don't, we'll get it to you. But it's really important how it's interpreted. So the blood test should not be done within two weeks of whelping. So you can use a progesterone that was done when she was being bred, um, or you can do it during the pregnancy, but not within two weeks of whelping because the antibody levels at that point are going to drop as all those antibodies rush to her mammary glands to nourish the puppies. So for this to be effective, it can't be within two weeks of whelping, and the puppies must have had a chance to nurse on the bitch to get an accurate result. So it's an estimate of the antibody passed to the puppy from the mother through the colostrum. Dogs don't get and cats don't get much antibody through the placenta like they do in people. Almost all their antibodies have to come through colostrum, which is the first milk. And if the puppies don't nurse in the first 12 hours, number one, the colostrum is not going to be there. And number two, their gut is going to change and not be able to absorb those huge antibody proteins. So it has to be done in the first 12 hours. So the way they calculate this is they do the titer test, which you're probably familiar with. And then they graph it because they know her antibody titers to December and parvo are going to drop in half or by 50% every two weeks. So they draw a graph on a computer and they can tell us when to vaccinate the puppies. So it's a customized vaccination protocol based on that bitch and that litter, only on that bitch and that litter. You can't extrapolate that data to her next litter. You can't use that information for other dogs in your kennel. But if you're a proponent of minimizing vaccination, this is the safest way to do it because now you know what the antibody levels are for the puppies. And Dr. Larson at the lab at Wisconsin will tell you exactly what weeks to give what vaccinations. And they're not all the same. I can tell you, we do lots and lots of these. And sometimes she'll say, just do parvo. Sometimes she'll say, just do December. Sometimes it's six weeks. Sometimes it's not until 12 weeks. So it's really useful information for you to customize the vaccination protocol. I don't work for the university. I don't work for Dr. Larson. I'm just going to tell you that it works really well. And we know that the antibody levels have to drop to a certain point for the vaccination to work. And that's why we vaccinate at 8, 12, and 16 weeks or whatever your veterinarian recommends. It's not because dogs need three vaccinations. They only need two. The problem is not every dog is going to respond the same. Not every litter is going to respond the same. So the veterinary industry has said, well, we're going to just average it out and say 8, 12, and 16 weeks. But if you're not a fan of vaccinating, then you want to do it with this protocol using the nomogram. So this is the um, place that you can understand and read more about the nomogram or the nomograph. So go to this website if you want to do some reading about it. And then if you want to submit this, this is where to get your camera out. If you want your veterinarian to draw blood and send it, this is how to download the PDF form to submit the lab sample. And this is the address for it to be mailed to. It takes four days to get the test run. So if you're you know, coming up on six weeks of the puppies being six weeks old, you don't want to start doing this right, right at that point. You want to do it earlier in the heat um, or earlier in the, the time that the puppies have been born. But do not draw the blood within two weeks, either way of whelping. So not until the puppies are more than two weeks old or more than two weeks before she's due to have the puppies. Heartworm and intestinal parasite control. I definitely want you to be aware that it's okay to use some of these products during a pregnancy and during lactation, but not all of them. Um, I have listed the most commonly used products, which are going to be ivermectin, moxidectin, milvamycin. Ivermectin is heart guard and interceptor. Moxidectin is ProHeart 12, the injectable. Milvamycin is sentinel and uh, in, uh, interceptor. Parental is Nemex. Selamectin is revolution. Lufenurone is sentinel. And Fenbendazole is panicure. Those are safe. 
what is not safe are the praziquantel and midacloprimide and spino uh, said, which is trifexis, so pay attention. And then for flea and ticks, it's okay to use Brevecto, which is the oral every 12 week, but the other orals called Semperica, Nexgard, and Cordelio are not tested. It's okay to use Fipronil, which is frontline. It's okay to use Selamectin again, which is revolution, but it's not okay to use the Capstar or the Cerestal Collar and some of these other products. Either they're not safe or they're not tested. So be sure you read the label and it should say it's safe in breeding animals. And when I say breeding animals, I mean all breeding animals. I mean the puppy that you're gonna keep that's eight weeks old and you're gonna put her in a breeding program when she's two. I mean the male dog. It has to say evaluated in breeding pregnant or lactating dogs. Breeding animals means all breeding animals. And you don't wanna give something at eight weeks of age that we're gonna find out later can cause a problem. The same with the male. So don't assume that just because it's a male, it's okay to use. All right, loss of appetite is really common during four stages of her um, reproductive cycle. During travel to a male dog or to a, a veterinary clinic, it's common for them to not eat well if they're off the road. Um, during standing heat, they'll frequently not eat well. During mid-pregnancy, they tend not to eat well. And just prior to whelping, they tend not to eat, to eat well. So you wanna feed a really palatable diet and make sure that she gets plenty to eat during that pregnancy between the fifth week and the ninth week so that she's beefed up enough that she's not gonna go into the labor and lactation underweight. Um, there's some really great diets on the market and we recommend that you're feeding a performance diet. It's really hard to read an appropriate label and get an idea of what's in these products. Labels will be very deceiving on what they say are in them. There's basically two categories of nutrients in the diets. There's macronutrients, which are gonna be fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. And then there's gonna be micronutrients and the labels can't tell you the whole story. Those are gonna be the vitamins and minerals, the glucosamines, the probiotics, all those little bitty tiny amounts of things. And the label isn't telling you how much is in it and what's in it. And we see a lot of fertility issues on diets that are inappropriate. So the very first question I ask a client when they call me and say, my bitches aren't getting pregnant. I wanna know what to do about it. I wanna put her on antibiotics. I wanna put her on this, I wanna put her on that. My first question is, what are you feeding? And if they're not saying they're feeding Purina Sport, that's the very first change I'm gonna make. Now, puppy food can also be fed during pregnancy, during lactation. It's a little higher in calories, a little higher in nutrients. Um, so it's also fine, but you wanna feed either a performance or a puppy diet. Raw meat diets, I'm in the process right now, I just finished writing an article for Revival on Neosporum, a parasite. Um, raw meat diets, I, I don't even know what to say. If this picture doesn't tell you what I think of them, I, I, I don't have any more to say to you. Don't do it. We see Neosporum, we see a lot of other parasites, we see Salmonella, Shigella, a lot of bacteria. So it's not safe to feed raw meat diets to bitches that are in a breeding program. And bitches need carbohydrates to grow their puppies and to lactate. So we don't wanna feed a grain-free or a potato-based diet. It's gonna take more carbohydrates than that. And we think some of these pea-based diets may have phytoestrogens in them interfering with male and female fertility. Um, we're not sure about it yet, but do pay attention to that. Now, there are some supplements that I like to see people use. If they're not in the amounts that we need in the diets, it can be hard to tell what they're, what's in some of the diets that are small brands or off brands that aren't Purina. So those supplements are gonna be DHA, folic acid, and then vitamin A and glucosamine. So DHA, is a nutrient that's also found in mother's milk and it's really important for vision and brain development. And these puppy diets that are the smart puppy diets have had DHA added to them. Um, there was some really important work done a few years ago in veterinary medicine and now they add DHA not only to puppy food, but to human baby formula. And what we know about it is we get smarter puppies. So one of the studies that was done was CCI, Canine Companions for Independence, um, they're a service dog organization based out of California. I have raised six of their puppies, and now my son, who's 20, or I'm sorry, 35 years old, is raising a CCI puppy for his family. And I'm really excited about it um, that I've handed off a kid that's interested in helping do something like this. But what CCI did was they did a study on 5,900 puppies. That's one heck of a lot of study, puppies in a study. And they found that bitches with their first litter, 50% of their puppies were graduating from the service dog program. And by litter five, they were down to 25% and they determined it was a DHA depletion. It's a fatty acid. She wasn't able to keep up with it by eating enough nutritionally in the regular diets that were on the market at the time. So these bitches had to be supplemented with DHA. 
you can buy DHA at the store, you can buy a diet that has DHA supplement in it. Um, DHA has also been shown to help reduce dementia in humans. So write it down because you might forget when we get done with the presentation. You wanna go online or go to the store and buy a bottle of DHA for you, buy a bottle of DHA for your puppies and go ahead and feed it. But be careful, sometimes those puppies are just too smart. We've actually had people come back and tell us that. This litter is too smart. Then the next nutrient that we have to be really careful that we're getting enough into them is folic acid. This is a single puppy in both of these pictures. The puppy on the right-hand side is a cleft palate. The puppy on the left-hand side has a spina bifida, which is that red dot. Between her shoulders and then between her back legs are her intestines because her abdominal wall was not complete. So this puppy had three midline defects. These are all related to folic acid. Now, there's a genetic cause and there's a nutritional cause. And the only study we have about folic acid for the amount that you should feed is um, done from, um, I think, Poland, and it was five milligrams per dog per day starting before the pregnancy to day 40 of the pregnancy. The problem is that's a lot of folic acid. Most folic acid on the human side comes in 400 micrograms. But this is the study that showed a reduction by 30 to 50 percent of the number of um, puppies born with cleft palates in pugs and chihuahuas with and without folic acid supplementation. So if you have a brachycephalic breed or you have a line of dogs that tends to have cleft palates, you can reduce the risk of it by giving folic acid, but they're still gonna have some if they genetically are programmed to do that. Now vitamin A given in excess quantities, including too much raw liver or cooked liver can also cause midline defects as can certain drugs. And those drugs include steroids like prednisone and it can also not just include the tablets, but it can include topicals, which would be eardrops and eye drops that contain steroids. There can be enough to cause a problem. So you wanna be really careful that you're not using any of those during pregnancy. And then trimethoprim sulfa, which is known as Bactrim or Albon, can also cause um, midline defects. So don't use those during pregnancy. Then glucosamines, um, again, those can be supplemented. Um, many of the Fiorina diets have adequate amounts of them, but glucosamines are another micronutrient that can um, really be useful in joint health. Probiotics um, really should be used during pregnancy and during lactation. We know it reduces diarrhea. We know it reduces mastitis, which is an infection of the mammary gland, and we know it reduces mastitis, which is an infection in the uterus. So we have, uh, two years ago at all the meetings that we went to back, remember in the day we used to go to meetings like in, in rooms with other people? Um, every lecture talked about probiotics reducing mastitis, metritis, and diarrhea. So really pay attention and use that. All right, vaginal microbiome. Now, like I said before, that's the bacteria that should be living in the vagina. So the vaginas should have bacteria. And now we know uteruses should as well. So should you do a culture in my world? The answer to that is really no. Um, we don't routinely culture bitches vaginally because we don't really know what's supposed to be there. The only thing we know isn't supposed to be there is brucellosis, but otherwise almost any bacteria that you can culture may be normal in a dog. So culturing is not really useful. And if someone asks you to culture your bitch, you can do a natural breeding to their stud dog. You can ask them to culture their stud dog's prepuce as well. So if they want to culture, you tell them you want to culture too. I generally don't think cultures are very useful. We get a mixed bag of bacteria. We don't know if it's supposed to be there or not. So I don't use cultures routinely. Um, should you routinely use antibiotics before we said no? The answer is still no. Um, are there times an antibiotic is appropriate? Yes, if you see white blood cells on the vaginal cytology, but not routinely. And then probiotics, anytime you use an antibiotic is important. A vaginal cytology is simple to perform at the veterinary clinic. Um, some people do these themselves. You want to use a plastic swab and it goes up into the vagina as in, in these three purple dog illustrations. I have had wooden swabs break off on me, so please don't use wooden ones. Number one, they splinter. Number two, they break off. That's a bit embarrassing. Um, when you get the swab, you want to roll it, not smear it onto the microscope slide, and then you need to stain it and look at it in the microscope. So most people are going to have their veterinarian do this. On a vaginal cytology, this is normal bacteria. The left side is normal bacteria. The right side shows neutrophils, the white blood cells. That's not normal in proestrus. So we see changes on vaginal cytology. Cytologies help us to tell if there's any sign of infection. They tell us if they're in heat and they tell us what stage of the heat cycle a dog is in. So vaginal cytologies are really useful and we still do those during our um, pre-breeding exams and during progesterone testing. But like I said, mixed bag is normal. 
and there was just an article published which is illustrated here if you want to look this up you can google this and find this article and it talks about the bacteria that are found now not only in the vagina but also in the uterus we used to think the uterus was a sterile place and now we know it's not the problem is that most of the bacteria that they're finding they're finding only with dna testing and not on culture so we have cultured a lot of uteruses in our practice and never grown anything and that's why is that these bacteria are really fastidious it doesn't mean bacteria is not there it means they're really fastidious and only in research right now are we going to be able to determine what bacteria are supposed to be there so please don't routinely use antibiotics um, and avoid those that cause birth birth defects if you need to but you want to be really careful with um, how you use antibiotics don't just put your dog on antibiotics because you're going to breed her so timing the breeding, we want to make sure we're doing vaginal cytologies as well as these other tests. So a vaginal cytology, again, can be done at your veterinary clinic. And this is a nice diagram of how it correlates with the stage of the ovarian development. That middle row is the ovarian, and then the bottom row is histology of the ovary. So it's kind of a cool slide. Um, on vaginoscopy, so if you have a veterinarian that does a vaginos vaginoscopy with a scope, with a TCI scope, these are the changes you'll, that you'll see. So the cervix should look like the middle one during the time that she's ready to be bred. The one on the right-hand side is um, also okay. The one on the left-hand side is when the bitch is not in heat. And progesterone testing is really important. We wanna do it for two reasons. One is to ovulation time her so we know when to do the breeding. And in our hands, a breeding should be done, a four to eight is when ovulation occurs. And that breeding should be done two days later with fresh semen and three days later with frozen semen. Some people still use LH testing. We have not used LH for a long time because the kits weren't available. Um, but there's really good information on LH as well as progesterone testing for when you should do your breeding. Now, the important thing is every vet clinic has a different progesterone machine and every progesterone machine has its own little quirks. So you don't want to compare one to another. You want your veterinarian to tell you when to uh, base their breeding on their ovulation timing so don't ask facebook friends when they should do the breeding don't you know go out there and put it on facebook and ask for how that's supposed to work the veterinary knows what their progesterone machine tells them and when they should be doing their breeding so be careful that you don't over interpret those things everybody has their own way that they interpret it it may be how fast it jumps it may be what the actual number is um, in our practice the other thing we do is we want it to be three days after ovulation if she's over 20 on her progesterone. If she's under 20, she's not ready yet for frozen semen. We want it to be in the teens when we're doing fresh semen and over 20 with frozen. The other important thing for ovulation timing is we wanna know when she's due to be unpregnant. And you may think it's easy to get your bitches pregnant, but we do have bitches that have high-risk pregnancies. And if we don't know what her due date is, we can't help to keep her pregnant until she needs to have that litter of puppies. So it's really important that we're doing progesterone testings for both timing the breeding and timing the delivery. So progesterone testing tell us when to breed, and then we're gonna talk about the type of semen and the type of insemination. So sometimes you can count on how receptive the female is. This is actually a picture one of my clients took and sent to me. Um, my dogs don't get married before they get bred, but hers do. Um, so female receptivity and male interest are both important aspects of when we know that it's time to do the breeding. Um, if you're doing a natural, if you are planning on a frozen semen breeding and the boys in your house are pretty quiet and all of a sudden one night they start screaming, they're probably right for which day to do the frozen breeding on. So there are different kinds of semen and different kinds of insemination. There's fresh semen, there's fresh chilled semen, meaning we put it in a box with extender and shipped it across the country. And there's frozen, meaning we froze it in liquid nitrogen and kept it there for decades until we were ready to use it. Natural breedings, of course, are only gonna be fresh semen. Vaginal AIs can be done with fresh semen or fresh chilled semen, and a AKC will allow you to register the litter that you bred yourself with fresh chilled semen. And then TCI needs to be done with frozen semen or surgical breeding with frozen semen. You don't wanna put frozen semen in vaginally because only 11% of the bitches bred with a vaginal AI with frozen semen are gonna get pregnant. So that's a waste of semen and a waste of your time and money. So be sure if you're using frozen semen that you're using someone that's experienced with progesterone timing and experienced with delivering the semen directly into the uterus, either by a surgical breeding or a transcervical insemination. Multiple sire breedings, of course, are kind of fun to do. I've done two of them on my own bitches. 
and my second litter, in fact, I was in touch with the breeder, the owner of the stud dog today, um, that we do actually have puppies from two different sires in my one litter. So for those of you naysayers who say, you only get puppies from one male, you're wasting your time. It's really not true. We've actually had three puppies from one male and one puppy from another in the same litter. So my sisters are only half sisters. So those are the things you can do. Are your breeding outcomes should be at least 75% pregnant if you're being successful. Um, we see a little bit less numbers um, of pregnancies with frozen semen and a little higher with natural, but that kind of gives you an average of what it should be. Um, and if you're getting lower numbers than that, then you want to be working with somebody that's more experienced. Um, again, like I said, there are vaginal cultures, which I don't usually do because we get a mixed bag, mixed bag of all kinds of bacteria. And the only thing we know for bacteria that's not supposed to be there is brucellosis, brucella, every other kind of bacteria under the sun may be there. You can do a culture with a transcervical scope and you can flush saline into the uterus. But again, I've never gotten a successful positive. Everything I've ever cultured from that has shown up negative, not because bacteria aren't there, but because those bacteria don't grow on culture. And the same with uterine biopsy. If we have a bitch with fertility issues and we culture her, um, I usually don't find anything, but cytology and histology can be really useful. So we biopsy the uterus, but when I've cultured it, I've never grown anything from there, unless there's an obvious infection. So I've seen a few septic pregnancies and I've seen a few pyometras with a pregnancy, but that's a different situation. Um, gestation and pregnancy, we're gonna talk about this. The diet fed, like I said, needs to be either a performance diet or a puppy diet so the bitch is getting adequate nutrition. The amount you should feed needs to, at the time of the ultrasound, you're still feeding the same amount that you did before she got pregnant. But at confirmation of the pregnancy at ultrasound, you want to increase her dietary intake by about 10% per week. Now, if ultrasound told you there was only one puppy, you probably don't want to do that much. If ultrasound told you there's 12 puppies, you might want to do more than 10%, but that gives you sort of a guideline for where to start. Many bitches don't eat well within a day or two of the time that they whelp, but they, they need to eat enough that they can lactate, and bitches need to have two to four times their normal daily intake during lactation. They eat as much as a sled dog eats when they're running the Iditarod during lactation. So it's really important that you get her on a quality diet and that she gets enough nutrition and enough water to get that taken care of for you. Calcium, I'm a huge fan of calcium gel, but only when she goes into labor and only during labor. Um, I don't start it prior to the time she's due to go into labor, but it really does. And the gels work much better than Tums or much better than um, any of the tablets. The injectable and the gel work best at whelping and it helps to keep the uterus contracting effectively. And you can use a lot less oxytocin or no oxytocin if you're using just calcium. And I've gotten a lot of my own bitches through a whelping with just calcium gel and no oxytocin. Um, and then the oral, after they start lactating, then powders or tablets can be used if you don't feel like there's enough calcium in the diet. If you have a small breed dog with a large litter, so like a 10-pound dog with seven puppies, you want to supplement her with calcium because she can't get enough calcium through a diet to keep her from developing eclampsia. Again, diarrhea is really common at the time of whelping. It may be stress. It may be that she worked really hard. It may be that she ate too many placentas. But the Fortiflora, the probiotic products can really help reduce diarrhea. And like I said before, they reduce mastitis and metritis. So if you've got a bitch that, or a line of dogs that tend to have mastitis at the time that they're lactating, don't reach for antibiotic, reach for a probiotic. So that's what I have for you tonight. I did um, wanna just let you know that I have this book and then I wrote this other little book here that just came out at Thanksgiving on pandemic puppies and this is a really great book for you to send home with people that are buying a new puppy and we're seeing a lot of people i don't know what you are but we're seeing a lot of people that have never had a puppy as an adult before they did when they were children growing up and they've managed to put off getting a dog and now that they're home with the pandemic their kids are home they're off work um, and they're not going back yet they're still looking for puppies so this goes through behavior and medical care um, spaying and neutering the delay of a Staying and neutering for those of you who are fans. It talks about titers for vaccinations, goes through vaccinations, heartworm, flea and tick, behavior, separation anxiety, crate training, all the things that most breeders want their new puppy owners to know. So this is the new puppy owner manual. Um, it's $20 on Amazon. So it's a really nice book for you to provide to people who are looking to buy a dog. It talks through how to pick a breeder. It goes through how to find the right dog for them based on the traits that they're looking for. And then it goes on into raising a new puppy. 
So we still have webinar, a webinar coming up on whelping and post whelping care of the dam and puppies. So that's going to be the next one. And I think we'll have a date coming up for that. And then this is how to reach me if you need something. So I want to thank everybody for hanging in there tonight. It's another long day for you if you've been at work. And thank you very much to Purina and AKC for helping sponsor this tonight. So thanks for coming, everyone. Now we have time for a few questions because I went really fast. Yes, you did. And you covered a lot of information there, Dr. Marty. Thank you very much for that. We do have a couple of questions and I'll start with a simple one. Um, you had mentioned uh, something about uh, having DHA in the, in the in the food. And we know that uh, Purina Pro Plan and their diets have a lot of DHA in many of their different products. And the question was, is if the food does not have DHA in it, is that when you recommending supplementing DHA and if so, how much? Yeah, that's what I recommend is if the diet doesn't appear to have DHA in it, and most of the purina puppy diets will, um, what we recommend, it, and it comes with capsules at the store, so it's pretty difficult to make them smaller. Um, a typical adult dog is going to get one or two of those capsules a day. If it's a small dog, you may want to give one every other day, or you might want to poke a hole because they tend to have that oil in them. Um, poke a hole and squirt a little of the oil on the food instead of giving a full capsule each day um, or caplet each day. So yes, DHA is definitely a benefit and there's, you know, you don't want to overdo it. Like you don't want to give a handful, but a capsule a day is not going to be overdoing it for even a small breed dog. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, this one I believe was probably actually covered in our previous webinar um, and it deals with uh, pre-pregnancy vaccinations. Um, if you want to top, touch on that, uh, which ones do you recommend uh, for pre-pregnancy vaccinations and when they should be given quickly? Sure, so you want to get make sure she's up to date before she comes into heat. So if she's due for rabies during the pregnancy, do rabies. Um, distemper lepto, I do recommend lepto for almost all of our dogs. There are very few parts of the country where lepto is contraindicated. Um, for some vet clinics, it's not a core vaccine. For mine, it is. We see lepto in our practice and we see dogs dying from it. So I think it's really important to vaccinate for lepto. And lepto can cause fertility issues in pigs, in cows, in dogs. So don't overlook lepto as a really important vaccine. Um, I know a lot of breeders tend to shy away from it, but the vaccines have gotten a lot more purified and they're much safer than they used to be. So those are really essential. Um, and Bordetella, I tend to use the intranasal, not the oral or the injectable for a number of reasons, but I like the intranasal and it reduces the risk of respiratory disease in the puppies when you have those um, vaccinations given. Now, if you live in certain parts of the country, you may need to do Lyme disease. You may need to use rattlesnake vaccine. Um, you know, there, there's differences based on geographical um, needs. So you wanna to talk to your veterinarian about that. And we um, do recommend influenza as well if you're going to be sending the dog out to dog shows or uh, going to other places where the dogs are gonna be interacting with other dogs. So those are the things that we recommend, but for sure distemper lepto parvo and for sure rabies. Okay, thank you very much for that quick answer. Um, we, we have a quick uh, question from Robin and she wants to know in regards to mastitis, do you feel that if a female has mastitis, uh, if, if she's had it once, will it continue in the future litters? And is there a standard treatment that you recommend for large breed dogs that seem to develop mastitis more often? The two things I do are I bathe the dog two or three days before she's due to have her puppies with chlorhexidine shampoo just to get her skin cleaned up. I want it two or three days ahead so that she still has a chance to smell like what she's supposed to smell like so the puppies can find her mammary glands when they're born and start to nurse. So don't do it the morning she goes into labor, do it two or three days ahead, but use chlorhexidine because it's going to reduce the bacteria on her skin and then use a probiotic. I do not recommend routine antibiotics. I do recommend that you don't do what my husband does and did. And he had one of my corgi bitches out in the pasture three days after she had her C-section, helping him load sheep into the trailer. So um, please don't let my husband come help you with this because you will probably lose your mind like I did. So keep her clean and use probiotics. And then if she develops mastitis, yes, an antibiotic is appropriate, but don't use it routinely as a preventive. Okay, um, we have a question, question from Christine and she says, what is OFA vertebrae and is that a breed specific or is that something we should screen for all breeding females? Yeah, and that's right now, I think it's just French Bulldogs. It might be another breed as well, but I think it's mostly Frenchies. 
Um, and those are looking for butterfly vertebrae and hemivertebrae. We don't even know what a normal number or an acceptable normal is in those, that breed. Um, so if you have labs, don't worry about it. If you have Frenchies or another breed, just, you know, just go to the website for OFA um, and type in under disease. So go OFA and then go to the diseases list and then go down to vertebrae and it'll tell you if your breed is one that they will test for. It is only one or two breeds right now. It's very uncommon to test for that. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'll throw in a quick plug for AKC Bread with Heart program. You can go to the website and check on that as well. And also go to the Parent Club websites as they're the experts for each breed. And under health, under their tabs on their websites, they would have a lot of great information. And our sponsors tonight, Prina Pro Plan, have been great sponsors of uh, Canine uh, Health Foundation and uh, sponsors uh, with um, uh, the Pro Club and, and, and their sponsorship of genetic health research. So thank you again, uh, Prina Pro Plan, for that. Moving on to our next question from Carrie, what is the oldest age to breed a female and uh, uh, what dose would you recommend calcium gel during whelping? So the oldest age depends on the bitch. Um, I don't like to breed bitches for their first litter after age six. I think it's pretty hard on them to deliver puppies if they've never done it before. Their pelvis isn't as flexible and their muscles aren't quite as good as they are when they're two or three years old. So I don't like to breed for the first time after age six. If they've been bred before and they've had a successful litter up to age eight is fine. Have I bred old, older dogs than that? Yes, I have. If they are really, really fit, like sled dogs, like field trial dogs, I mean, these dogs have to be in top physical condition. And I will not breed a dog in that age group without a CBC and chemistry panel to make sure that her organ function is sufficient to support the pregnancy. We've seen dogs go into kidney failure because the burden on their kidneys with a pregnancy is too great. We've seen dogs go into liver failure. So check her out first. And in our practice, because we're in Wisconsin, we test every brood bitch before she's bred for Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and ehrlichia. We do that SNAP40X test because I've seen too many bitches die of heartworm or get sick of Lyme, with Lyme disease during the pregnancy. So don't overlook testing for those things as well. Um, the second question was how much calcium, and it depends on the size of the dog. Um, on big dogs, I'll use two or three of those little clicks on the tube. On small dogs, I'll just use one. It's really hard to overdose on the gel orally. You can overdose on injectable calcium if it's given IV or sub-Q in too large an amount or the wrong concentration. But the oral calcium, now you're not gonna give a whole tube, but the oral calcium, one or two clicks for each puppy is pretty much what I do. So she has a puppy, I give her a little calcium. She has a puppy, I give her a little calcium, maybe a little ice cream. And there's not enough calcium and ice cream by itself to get you the calcium levels you need. But it does give you gl glucose, some energy, and it does give you some fluids. And a lot of those bitches are 24 to 48 hours since their last meal. So when they're in labor, it's hard on them. They need some energy, they need some calcium, they need some fluid to successfully deliver that litter. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Was, uh, Sandy has asked, uh, and I believe we touched on this a little bit, uh, what do you suggest for females with ovarian cysts? Is there anything else you'd like to add to that top part you covered? Yeah, and those are the bitches that, and it can be really hard to tell an ovarian cyst from an ovarian tumor from a split heat. So I'm going to preface any remark by saying it takes a skilled ultrasonographer to determine which is which, and a lot of bitches will come into heat and they'll start to rise. Their progesterone will get to two or three, and then it sits there, and then the bloody discharge goes away, and then they go home, and six weeks later, they come back into heat. That's a split heat, really common, especially in the northern breeds. A cystic ovary is where they get close to five, and then they just sit there, and the progesterone doesn't rise. So if you have a really skilled veterinarian with a really great ultrasound machine, they may be able to see an ovarian cyst on that machine. The tricky part is it can be hard to tell that from a tumor, and tumors are typically a problem in the older bitches, but it can happen. So I have seen maybe four ovarian tumors in my career, and we manage hundreds and hundreds of pregnant dogs a year in our practice. It is not common to have ovarian cancer in the dog. But if you think there's an ovarian cyst and you've got a great skilled ultrasonographer, you can sedate the dog, direct the needle into the cyst, and pull that fluid out, send it to the lab and have it tested for progesterone, tell them it's from an ovarian cyst, and those progesterone levels may come back up 5,000, no kidding, 5,000 out of the cyst. If you can't do that or if she doesn't respond to it, we'll give injections of GnRH for three consecutive days. Um, it's a, it's a uh, cow drug called Cysterellin, not the nun, Cyster 
Ellen, but Sister Ellen, C-Y-S-T. Um, and that can help that cyst to resolve and then kick her into the rest of her heat cycle. If it's been more than 21 days since she started her heat and her progesterone hasn't risen into the 20s at that point, I will not breed a bitch on that heat cycle because it's not likely to be a fertile cycle. You could do a natural breeding if you want. Don't use frozen semen because she's not going to get pregnant. You're just going to waste really valuable semen on a bitch with low fertility. So if you think it's an ovarian cyst, get somebody that really knows what they're talking about to help you with it. Okay, we're about to come to a close, and we have one quick question uh, that I'll go ahead and throw out there this evening, and this is a two-part question, and the first part of it being, um, what age do you recommend the first breeding to uh, occur on? And then the second part of the question from another person is, um, should you breed back-to-back, -back and at what age should you retire your females? Sure. Um, retire retirement we've already talked about. Um, Back to back is fine. I tend to breed two cycles on and then one cycle off and then two more on. We used to say skip every other, you know, just go every other cycle and skip one in between. I don't say that anymore, but I do like to give them one cycle off because nutritionally it takes a bitch eight months to get back to where she was, even on a performance diet like the Sport 3020 or even on a puppy diet, it can take her eight months to get back to that level. So I think it's really important that we give her a cycle off after two and make sure she's on DHA. What's the youngest I breed? Well, it depends on the breed. If we have a breed that needs to have hips done, of course, we wanna make sure that they're fully two years old to do their full oral phase certification. If you have the need to breed her younger, you can do pen hip or you can do a prelim OFA. Um, I don't like to breed on the first heat because A, they're babies, and B, they rarely get pregnant because they're really not ready yet, unless, of course, it happens when you're not looking. And you thought that you're um, eight month old female with your six month old male were safe and then of course you're going to have a pregnancy because um, we all know that's how life works um, but I usually like to breed for the first time when they're around two I bred bitches a little younger if they've had prelims and and they're otherwise in good health or they're a breed that doesn't do hips um, and the larger breeds do take longer to mature so the giant breeds like St. Bernard's and Great Danes those bitches probably I wouldn't breed until they're two and a half Okay, I think we're getting pretty close to the end of our meeting. Um, I do see several other questions here that are really good questions, and um, I want everybody to know that the questions that we did not get to this evening uh, will be available um, uh, to, to you, uh, and we'll be able to answer those for you, and Dr. Greer will have that uh, those in her meeting notes um, after the presentation if we did not get to those questions. Um, I believe we have just a couple more minutes, so uh, Dr. Greer will talk very quickly. And uh, one p person has asked that you mentioned uh, uh, not giving vitamin A excess or as in giving liver. So uh, in questioning, do you not recommend feeding liver? And then um, the it, and also what type of anesthesia do you recommend uh, for a C-section? And those will be our last two questions. Sure. No, I don't use vitamin A supplementation or liver during pregnancy or even before because vitamin A is one of the four fat-soluble vitamins. A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble. They're stored in the body, and too high a level does cause cleft palate. So avoid feeding excessive amounts of vitamin A or excessive amounts of liver. Now, if you give her a little snibble of liver to help her appetite, that's okay. But don't be given big old hunks of liver. Um, Purina has gone to a lot of money and a lot of time and trouble to balance the nutrient profile correctly in that diet. And as soon as we start messing around with it by adding things like vitamin A and liver to it, we've really messed up that really beautifully developed diet. Um, the second question on anesthesia, I use alfaxin or propofol. My new darling is alfaxin. I've used a ton of propofol over the years, but I like alfaxin even better for induction. I don't use any pre-med, I don't use any narcotics. And then during the anesthesia itself, we use isoflurane or sevoflurane. And then all my bitches go home on either Rimadyl or Medicam. Medicam is my preferred one for post-op pain management. I don't like tramadol. I don't like narcotics. I think bitches are confused and tend to lay on their puppies and tend to be snarky at their puppies from those narcotics. But Medicam and Rimadyl, I've been using that for over 20 years and have never created a problem with it that I've regretted. Um, the bitches are happier, they feel better, they're going to lactate better, they're going to lay down for their puppies better, they're going to be better mothers with the right anesthesia, and the puppies are going to revive better with the right anesthesia. No dextomator, and make sure she goes home on pain medication. 
because those bitches need to be comfortable. I actually had a sales rep tell me that bitches were so euphoric after they had a C-section, they didn't need pain medication. Obviously, it was a guy who said that, not a woman, because he would never have said something that, or she would never have said something that stupid. Only a guy would say euphoria will overcome that much pain. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marty. If you'll move your slides back to the uh, one, two slides back where it has information about your book. We've had a couple people asking about that, or you can just uh, go to uh, the link there for Dr. Marty Greer and she'll be able, you'll, you can contact her. I believe those are also available on Amazon. Um, and I would like to uh, thank our sponsors, Purina Pro Plan. Uh, for bringing you this great presentation tonight by Dr. Marty Greer. And again, um, if you have any questions that were not answered here, feel free. You can also email me directly at um, uh, SRM, as in my initials, Stacy Ray Mason. So SRM at AKC.org. And that email again, SRM at AKC.org. And I am happy to... Uh, make sure that your questions are answered and, and uh, pertaining to a number of the questions that we did not be, be, get to this evening. And we'd like to thank you each and every one for attending. And again, the presentation will be available for review later on and you will receive an email about that. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us this evening.